Hello and welcome back to Unique's European Spaces of Culture Conference, taking EU cultural relations to the next level. Over the next hour and 15 minutes, this sync session will take a closer look at how changes in the digital realm are impacting intercultural exchange and how the EU can extend its human-centered approach to ensuring a safe, fair, and equitable baseline for all that happens therein. We are lucky to be joined by colleagues calling in from three continents today and bringing to the conversation four distinct perspectives on how the accelerated digital transformation of the past few years, and of course, this past year, 2020 in particular, is altering the way we communicate, particularly in the culture sector. So before we begin, could I just ask each of the panelists to briefly introduce yourselves and also let us know where in the world you are calling in from um, and maybe just say a word about your organization in case anyone is unfamiliar. Um, Elisa, you're on the left of my screen, so um, could you start, with, please? Yes, of course. Thank you, Caroline, and I'm very happy to be here today. My name is Elisa Lindinger. I'm the Managing Director of Superlab, um, which is an, a nonprofit organization based in Berlin, where I'm also calling in from today. Um, at Super, we explore the potentials of new technologies uh, for society and also for diversity and representation. And our lens, on the lens of our work, is intersectionally feminist. In the past year, we've also worked with many organizations, both from culture, from, from the social sector, to evaluate how digital transformation in the past year has impacted their work. But Super is not only a lab, it's also a community, a community of, um, of women, of non-binary people, of trans men, uh, and uh, that are in the arts, in research, scholars, journalists, technologists, and with them together, we try to figure out uh, what a technological digital world we actually want to shape. Excellent. Um, and yes, the digital world does have a way of turning us into flat humans. Um, so it's very nice to have a lot more dimension added back into that idea of what a digital person might be. Um, uh, following, Harry, could you tell us where you're calling in from and a bit about your piano? Yeah, thanks, Caroline. Um, so my name is Harry Verwijn. I'm the general director of your piano foundation, and I'm sitting in my office for the first time in a long time uh, in The Hague. Um, today I almost regret it. It's a beautiful day out there. <laughs> um, so yeah, Europeana is uh, it's both a platform. We're an organization of about 70 people, uh, 20 different nationalities. Um, we're also a community, um, just like uh, Elisa was saying about her organization. Uh, we work with close to 3,000 uh, professionals from the uh, library museum, uh, the glam sector, if you want, across Europe and the world. And uh, I think that's that's what re really makes it exciting. You know, our aim is to yeah, make our cultural heritage digitally uh, accessible. Um, we really believe in, in the diversity and, and making it more equitable. Um, so you hear me say a few things about um, yeah, how, how could we develop a healthy digital public sphere, if you want, uh, using cultural heritage um, for Europe. Sounds good, especially as an American where the public sphere is now increasingly controlled by private interest. It's nice to know that there is a public foundation um, in Europe taking care of some of these narratives. So um, we'll look forward to exploring further in just a moment. Uh, Anupama. Hello everyone and good evening from Singapore, where I join you from today. I am the Director for Culture at the Asia Europe Foundation. Uh, some of you may know it as ASEF. We are a publicly funded organization receiving funds from 50 plus countries, both in Asia and Europe. And this includes all the countries in the European Union. Uh, we've been around now for 25 years and our main goal is to get Asian and European professionals and uh, organizations connected. I particularly work in the area of culture. So we've been in the business of setting up face-to-face -face encounters and cultural exchange opportunities uh, for Asian and European cultural professionals, networks, uh, institutions, and, uh, and museums. And as you can imagine, the last year has been uh, spectacularly difficult and challenging for us to try and convert uh, 25 years of moving people into a digital space. So I'm looking forward uh, to this conversation to hear from all of you and also to share some of the lessons uh, we have learned at uh, ASA. Thank you. 
Wonderful. And as I understand it, uh, over the past two years, Asia is the sector of the world that has gone the most online, I think, followed just by um, African countries. So I can imagine it's been, I'll be interested to hear more about uh, about how that you felt that changed on an um, organizational level. Um, and so, and now, Bennett, uh, could we also uh, hear from you, please? Yes, uh, my name is Bemnet Demese. I'm from Ethiopia, and uh, I'm representing the, the Baddawai Street Art Project. Uh, me and my colleagues got the chance to execute this uh, European Space of Culture funded uh, project. Uh, and the Badawa is a street art festival that aims to take art into the streets of uh, the city that allows the general public to get access to uh, culture and art. So I will be discussing about how, uh, how we took uh, this festival into uh, an online platform when it comes to these uh, difficult times. Quite a challenge. And uh, we heard from your colleague uh, earlier today uh, about the project in general. So it will be interesting to hear how then that can be fit into uh, a device. Um, okay, well, thank you all for being here and thank you for everyone who's listening. If there's any problem with the audio, um, please do uh, please do drop a message in the Conviva platform. Um, I also want to just briefly offer some practical information as we've been flipping back and forth between platforms. Um, but it, as each panelist tells us a bit more about their project, please feel welcome to drop questions into the Conviva interface. And um, uh, another of our colleagues will relay those questions to us. If they happen to relate to the particular point of, you know, if there needs to be some kind of clarification, then we will turn to that question right away. Otherwise, we will save all questions for the last 15, 20 minutes and we will address them then. Um, so I'm Caroline Busta. Uh, I'm a co-founder of newmodels.io, which is a digital platform and community, and I am based in Berlin. So um, without further ado, let's uh, start with Elisa. Um, uh, each panelist is going to speak for about 10 minutes. We'll get a little bit more depth and then we'll bring everybody together in about 40 minutes. Um, but so Elisa, let's let's start with you. Um, you're just across the city here, um, uh, sharing the same sunlight. Uh, and I, I wonder, can you tell us about, about, you know, maybe in the past year since we have been in this digital space, which does compress identity and um, does force us to to confirm ourselves as, oh, I'm a female living in Berlin, check. And, and in all these ways in which we're forced to, to narrow our identity. Um, can you give us a bit about how Super is pushing back against that or creating some more space for humans to, to be a little bit more pliant and a little more flexible? Yeah, thank you. Yes, I'd, I'd love to share one project particularly that we have been working on for the past year. Uh, this project is called The New New, and as the title says, it tries to, uh, I don't know, like engage in new things, test out new things, new strategies, and also make voices heard that um, have not been heard as broadly as they would definitely deserve. The New New, you can check it out if you want on the new new dot space. Um, it is a project supported by the Bertelsmann Stiftung here in Germany, by the Allianz Kultur Stiftung and also the Goethe Institute. And um, we kicked off this project in which we want to try out like more things and more strategies. We kicked it off with a fellowship program and uh, this fellowship called the New Fellowship um, is meant to show that better digital futures are possible and we want to explore how to get there. And of course, we don't have all that knowledge like within our very like small, limited, also very German team. So what we try to do is to give fellowship grants to artists, to researchers all across Europe um, to enable them in the work that they're already doing and trying to figure out um, how to get more diversity visible on the web, how to create safe and brave spaces on the internet. Um, and uh, yeah, with this fellowship, we um, want to support people who are not only creating digital tools, like in the strictest sense, like apps or platforms, but also artistic projects, cultural projects, and also other means to work towards a just and a fair digital future. Um, and as uh, Harry Verweyen said, it's, it's really about creating a healthy, or as we like to say, a safe and a brave digital public sphere in which a multitude of voices can be heard. 
And um, yeah, as a result, um, during the pandemic, we had an open call. We had all these, you know, we had our minds made up. We want to have a great kickoff festival in person in Berlin, invite everyone. Of course, all of this did not happen. Um, but still, we have 12 fellows from all across Europe that we are supporting now, 12 fellowship projects, to be more precise. And um, it just goes to show that there are great artists activists researchers out there that are shaping these visions that we are looking for not just digitally digital visions but also social visions for these more just more equitable futures and um, i think it's our job to reach out to them and uh, give them the platform that they deserve yeah, absolutely. It's great work that you all are doing. Um, and I, you know, I know a lot of this is, uh, it, it's, it's sometimes not just you can make a checklist of here are the 10 things that we should do. Um, and it is more a bit more atmospheric. It is more about just shifting the range of possibility. Um, but are there any takeaways that you have at this point? Are there any themes that have emerged uh, among the different fellows that you feel um, our, our European colleagues should hear right now? Um, first of all, let me highlight one thing that is not so much among the fellows, but um, it's more about uh, the format in itself. Uh, I already said that, you know, we had intended this like to be a, a physical meetup to bring all the people together and like create this network uh, on a one on one basis. But it turned out that working digitally has even been more inclusive, like we can work with from like we can use digital tools that enable like live translation services, mm -hmm. live captioning, all these things that that are not as easy to provide in a, in a classic conference setting or a classic workshop setting. So this is something that has really um, helped us to, you know, not just be the, the English speaking academia. There are groups in, in, in Europe that are not as, as happy uh, to communicate in, in, in English, for example. Um, so uh, this is something that has really turned out very worthwhile. And this is something that we also want to to keep uh, in times after the pandemic. Mm, among the fellows, what has emerged um, maybe as a common denominator between them is that um, they, yes, they do see technology and digital transformation as potentially critical. And I think in Europe, we are very good, and maybe especially in Germany, we are very good at criticizing technology. We are very good at, at raising the admonishing finger and pointing out all the, all the faults and the flaws. Um, but those 12 fellowship projects really go beyond this, this step of criticizing technology and the digital sphere and try to develop with the tools and with the resources that they have to develop develop new, yeah, new tools, new approaches, um, new engaging media, interactive things um, that, that, that give hope and that bring people together and that don't just criticize and, and talk about the negative things. Now, I believe that this positive connotation that they all share is really the thing that brings them together and also makes them want to collaborate. I know that we are all lamenting about these digital things uh, and probably rightly so, but um, let's also see what they can help us to achieve and how they can help us improve our own workflows. So you're saying that in short, even after this um, COVID pressure um, subsides, we should continue seeking um, to uh, to form digital connections with our colleagues because it does allow increased accessibility. Um, and I can imagine too, with like the ability to do different kinds of filters, there's also a feeling that you can embody different identities, which is interesting. And as much as um, the screen can force us to um, be a certain strict profile, it can also allow us to play in in, in, a, in a more imaginative or gaming type space where we can extend our identities. Um, so Super is a really great platform. I definitely recommend everybody to check it out. Um, and I think it can teach us a lot about creative ways of, uh, you know, of, of connecting with each other, um, not just in an artistic context, but taking those tools and applying them to everyday professional context as well. Um, I, I think we have just another minute or two um, before we should move on to Harry. And maybe this is actually a point of connection. So we're about to hear a bit about Europeana. I wonder if your organization, um, how it is dealing with the archive or if it's trying to push up against the archive as we go through this period of uh, moving 
out of a, a traditional library into a digital space? Are there any pieces of advice that um, that you're hearing from your fellows about how to archive, how to catalog um, now with this maybe broader sense of what an identity or what an archive can be? Hmm. That, that's a really interesting question because um, I, I know that Europeana is such a such a great um, example for both like a, a, a huge archive and also working like in a decentralized manner. And I think this is really what our, our fellows would, would highlight as well, that um, this is not so much about like the digital, digital transformation is a way to, you know, not so much for for large cultural institutions to gather and like keep their ha like hands over or their heads over um, the, the the data and the resources that are being created, but really to to spread them, to also support them where they are created, and you know just just interconnect them in a meaningful way, and this way make them more visible and more accessible to others. So let's use that kind of anarchic um, decentralized yeah. structure of the internet also in the cultural sector if we if we go digital. Yeah, that's great. And that is one of the huge potentials of how the internet is changing to something that is more decentralized. Um, and I love this idea of supporting culture where it's created in all of its locales. Um, and I wonder as a way of transition, Harry, um, when you hear that, what, how do you see Europea Europeana already supporting that kind of an archive, that, that sense of decentralization of supporting culture where it's happening? Um, yeah, I think that's a, that's a great, segue and I think you know the decentralized model that um, we worked with with European I, I could actually say that's probably already uh, an export model of Europe towards the rest of the world and I'm saying this of course uh, with humbleness this is not like we invented it uh, but I think the way that uh, we were able to implement it in European was what worked really well and let me explain a little bit about you know what the essence of that was. We're of course not completely decentralized. You know, the European Commission is a very central or centrally organized organization uh, that supports Europeana, both financially through policies and so forth. Uh, so there's a very strong central element to it. But um, as the European Union, the European, uh, the European Commission works with all the member states, right? Uh, Europeana is a very decentralized network in the sense that we work with 4,000 libraries, museums, archives across Europe. Um, and the only thing that we're really doing, if I bring it, boil it down to its absolute essence, is to collaboratively set standards. Uh, I think it's really as simple as that. Uh, both technically, technical architecture on the data side and on copyright. And that is the essence of Europeana's model uh, and of course, that is super decentralized, if you want. Uh, it allows the data to flow wherever it needs to go. And I think that is something that uh, you know, I now see being picked up as a model. Uh, you know, the United States, uh, in some places in Asia. I was at the launch uh, last week of the uh, Asia Pacific uh, Intangible Cultural Heritage uh, Network, which was fantastic. We could share some of the lessons we've learned. Uh, and I think it's a model that that could work really well uh, in terms of intercultural exchange for Europe. Um, yeah, of course, there, there are many things that that need to we need to learn. How do you build communities um, in a in a in a equitable and diverse sense? As Elisa is uh, work is is progressing. Uh, you know, we're we're not done learning for, for the next ten years, but I think that's that's how I see that being a model that could really work. This building communities, I think, is so important. And increasingly, again, as people feel the limitations of Web2 social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, they see how the uh, the motivations behind these platforms end up driving not necessarily the most tolerant or the most open-minded kinds of communities. Um, I wonder how is Europeana working as a public space, a, a, a commons, so to speak, a cultural commons? What are some of the, in, in as many specific or practical terms as you can use as possible in this answer would be helpful. Like how, where physically, um, what do you imagine like the shape of this of this public space to be? Like, how are you forming it? Is it happening in decentralized platforms in lots of different places? Do you see it as creating an actual um, digital platform where people interact? What are some of the terms of this public space that you're creating? Mm. 
Yeah, that's that's a great question, um, a difficult one too. Um, I think when you when you talk about data spaces uh, or digital public spheres, right? There, there's an incredible room for interpretation. Um, I could argue, for example, that you know, on the one hand, it could be positioned as uh, in a fairly traditional sense, uh, where there's this cloud. Imagine a cloud of data. Uh, available for everyone, but mostly as oil, if you want, for you know, uh, commercial organizations to build new businesses on. Now, that's one way of looking at it, and I'm not against it. I think it's it's great that there is uh, a resource of cultural heritage available for uh, commercial exploitation, if you want. But I think if we if we reframe that as a digital public sphere, I think uh, we'll find ourselves in a very different context. I mean, the, the data would still need to be available, decentralized, cloud-based, uh, based on interoperability. But we'd also imagine uh, platforms of interaction, if you want, uh, built on uh, open source uh, technological stacks, uh, really you know, taking all those values that we hold dear, you know, all the way through the stack and and really to allow interactions with, with audiences, with the public, if you want. Um, yeah. And here we're, we're talking about, you know, what could an alternative, you know, a public alternative look like for the big five commercial platforms that uh, you highlighted earlier, Caroline. Um, and I think that'll be critically difficult um the expectations around those things will be will be high um you know do we have it in our dna as public organizations to be able to uh, support that i think that'll be a big question that's a Maybe. very clear yeah very very clear articulation of that thank you yeah. thank you there's one more thing i, I want to say about it because we started uh, you know about uh, you know communities and how do you how do you nurture uh, great conversations because that's i think the essence of having community and we're doing some very interesting work at the moment uh, we're building what we call a community pact if you want which is basically setting the rules of engagement for how do we want to interact what do we find okay and not okay in our community and how do we act upon that uh, so it goes beyond way beyond a uh, a code of conduct which you know you typically would would read uh, you know don't be don't be a jerk uh, which is fine uh, but you know what does it mean to be a jerk if you want and uh, how do we understand that to happen and what do we do about it I think that that'll be a big step if we can actually formulate that in our communities uh, to build those communities uh, going forward I mean that's actually huge you're basically writing something that's beyond just the terms of service which we know have caused a lot of problems when we think about deplatforming major political figures or certain media outlets um, and when you say this just to be clear your piana is currently working on a, um, a code of conduct uh, or the sub organizations that um, you're encouraging it uh, how, how is that how are you actually formulating that what is the process the process is that we we take um... We take a series of trainings, uh, facilitated trainings by an expert, Lauren Vargas. Um, and uh, we do that both with uh, the European Foundation Office as well as uh, members of our community. Um, so those are you know, professionals all over Europe uh, who can participate in this. And we work ourselves through you know, some difficult questions. You know, what do we find acceptable? What do we don't find acceptable? Uh, how do we feel it's appropriate to call people in instead of calling people out on big black. Oh, great. I mean that I, I just that is so important. I mean, I feel like we could have a whole conference um, just on <laughs> just on on this step. Um, but uh, I also wonder, um, in terms of you know, of course, what makes sense for a European Commission? Do you find you know as we will soon uh, transfer to Anupama Sikar and talk about the Asian perspective? How are you taking into an account uh, like a a global view. I mean, the hard thing about codes of conduct or terms of service is what's appropriate for one cultural context may not quite work for another. Um, how, what is that process? And what is the process also of revision as, as you come up against different points of friction and modification of this code of conduct? Yeah. Um, to be honest, Karen, we're, we're at the, the early stages of that process. Sure. Uh, so I would imagine that we, I mean, that, that's how we look at it. it. It's a living document. Every quarter, this thing should be revised once we have it. Uh, and, and you're right. I think 
taking all these different cultural backgrounds and perspectives in, 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 into play uh, will be very important. I don't expect this to, to become a, you know, these are the list of words that we can't say during a conference. I think it will, it's much more, it will be about, uh, you know, how do we nurture an empathetic mindset, you know, when mm. you enter a space and what does that mean? What kind of questions do you then ask and so forth? So it will be more on that level, which I think should be able to accommodate many more things. Absolutely. I think hopefully we've all learned a bit in the past 10 years about what happens when you have watchwords. Um, you end up charging them even more, right? You make them more powerful than they were to begin with. So creating um, a culture of empathy, a culture of tolerance is does seem like really the the way to go there. And I think anybody with a, with a Discord community, anybody who's trying to uh, run their own community now understands the importance of creating that empathetic culture. So I think you see that happening on a very local level. And um, it's great to know that it's it's also being considered on a very macro level like your Piana. Uh, so it will set a, um, a kind of precedent, hopefully, for other organizations to follow. Um, I, I wonder, uh, so that we can get into a more integrative conversation, if we do move now to Anapama and we do ask a bit about ASAF, Asia European Foundation, um, maybe can you tell us a bit about how your last year has been and, uh, you know, 60% of the, like, I guess 60% of the world is now online um, and it's actually quite a big change in the past two years alone. And uh, the one of the biggest areas has been Asia. Um, what are some of the lessons you've learned and maybe what is one banner program that you've been working on? I know ASAF does quite a few things. Uh, for us, I would say that the, the last year has been interesting because uh, one of our flagship programs prior to the, to the pandemic was uh, a mobility first travel grant. Uh, it's often quite difficult for Asian cultural professionals to travel within Asia and towards Europe. So this project since 2017 uh, has been one of our big uh, projects with, uh, I think it's, it's, we get about 1000 applicants and we were able to support only about 150 of them per year. So you can see the, the, the demand there. And uh, one of the big challenges we faced was how to keep this interest in cultural exchange going at a time when uh, it looks borders are kind of closed indefinitely. And we have tried to transform these projects into the digital space in, in more ways than one. So I think for us 2020 and 2021, have literally been um, a, a moment for experimentation. So we've tried to adapt the artistic residency model to an online model. So we've been incubating very small pilot projects, but always in, in partnership with other organizations, including most recently with the MCAT uh, network in, in Europe. So we've tried peer-to-peer -peer connections. We have tried mentor-mentee connections. We've tried to do Asia-Asia combinations of bringing cultural professionals together and also Asia-Europe. We've we'll tried to, to work a little bit across sectors and bring journalists and policy experts together. So we've been experimenting uh, with these on one hand. So these are our residencies that we try to curate and coordinate. On the other hand, we, we transform the travel grants into digital micro grants. So people are already working uh, digitally. So we decided to simply give them micro grants to support what they're already doing. They don't have to invent anything uh, new. And we see a whole range of, of projects that have gone online and have used our grant either to, to deliver an artistic output or simply to engage in the process to have uh, partnership meetings, network meetings, etc. And uh, next week we'll be launching a, a new open call for, uh, for the micro grant along with our partner, the Cambodian Living Arts. And this is more to look at networking because we see a plethora of digital projects. Everyone's producing artwork, texts, etc. And we've been receiving a lot of complaints about people as to this, the networking part is missing digitally. We just want to have that coffee we would have had in a conference and would have had this little chat with someone and got to know someone new. So next week we're launching um, basically micro grants uh, for just having a cup of coffee digitally uh, to meet new people and organizations uh, across Asia and Europe will be invited to, to apply. And the idea was that, you know, networking is something that we often don't compensate people for their time, ideas, and for making new connections for us. So here we'll be able to give people a little, a little honorarium, uh, something very modest for their time, uh, for their energy, and also to, to open doors and, and connect people that they feel should be connected. So we're hoping that these experiments that we are conducting this year will, will work. And uh, depending on what works and what is also needed on the ground, 
uh, we hope that we'll be able, along with our partners, to scale things up uh, next year. So in terms of the practical projects on the ground, this is uh, what we have been doing in, in, in the last 18 months. And uh, looking at it from a bit of a, of a macro perspective, from an Asia-Europe perspective, I would uh, say that the digital shift that we have seen since, uh, particularly since the, the pandemic, uh, has definitely provided an opportunity to sort of both widen and deepen EU-Asia cultural partnerships in, in at least three ways. Uh, in the past, inadequate travel grants for Asians as well as uh, complex visa application processes did impede the ability of a majority of cultural practitioners from parts of Asia to, to fully participate in international cooperation projects. And, and that is the ground reality. Uh, only a few were able to access this kind of an exchange, either because their country had a very strong passport or they were employed full time and were able to show the necessary financial assets and salary slips that, that are critical uh, to, to secure a visa. So I think now we have a rare opportunity in the EU Asia context, uh, really for projects to widen their circle of interlocutors beyond the usual suspects. And I think we should definitely uh, take advantage of this. Secondly, uh, internet penetration, as you already mentioned in the Asia Pacific, is pretty good, particularly on mobile and uh, smartphones. Uh, it stood already at about 50% in 2019 prior to the pandemic. And it is not restricted to the more developed economies in Asia, such as Singapore, or South Korea, or Japan, uh, China, Malaysia, India, Indonesia, Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam, and even Myanmar prior to the current political uncertainties are extremely well connected. So here again, I see a great opportunity for the EU to actually deepen some of the existing connections that already exist in these cultures and, and countries, even though we're not able to, to travel and, and engage with them. And a third factor, which I would say applies not only to Asia, but to a digital project anywhere, is that uh, I believe that our funding now can, can go a longer way if we are temporarily not spending on, on travel or accommodation costs. Because very often cultural cooperation projects in the Asia-Europe context, they thrive for about one to three years when the funding is, is secure and concrete. But when the funding ends, then a good part of what has been built sort of slowly fizzles away, including sometimes uh, project websites where there's a whole lot of valuable information. So I believe that now there is an opportunity to invest a little bit in the post project phase so that we can really embed the knowledge and networks that we have created through a project much more permanently in the local ecosystem. And this has uh, always been a weak point uh, for funders and for beneficiaries because very often we're just rushing off to implement the, the next project. But having said all this, uh, definitely all is not rosy. And I would say that uh, digital equity remains one of the most challenging social justice issues of our times, for sure. There are many Asias, uh, only a few belong to the global north, most of them belong to the global south. So uh, there, there is the problem of digital infrastructure, of internet costs, of certain platforms being available and others not. Uh, even language is a very, very big problem. It's often forgotten in the conversations around equity, uh, but restricting ourselves to English speaking Asians uh, will definitely result in attracting only a certain kind of professional. Uh, so this is something uh, Eliza already brought up. Investing, I think, in, in a pool of local interpreters or platforms that make interpretation easier is an absolutely valuable tool that immediately widens uh, the circle that we are operating with in, in, in Asia. And uh, the other thing which I see increasingly happening, which is very encouraging, is that uh, new digital routes are being uh, uh, connected uh, by bringing together more unusual suspects in terms of the countries uh, connected in Asia-Europe cultural projects. And I say this because the strongest Asia-Europe cultural networks are, uh, alas, often still along the old colonial routes, for instance, between the Netherlands and Indonesia. Very, very good cultural connections exist on a long-term basis. So I think digital offers a sort of a, a relatively inexpensive alternative to build new silk routes between more unusual suspects, perhaps between the Central Asian Spain countries and Eastern Europe, uh, the connections are extremely uh, weak. And uh, there, there are two ideas that I would like to, to leave with, with our audience today in terms of uh, making digital equity find its rightful place 
in EU Asia cultural partnerships, especially at a time where we are largely digital in our work. Uh, and I think in, in the short to medium term future, will remain largely hybrid as well. First, that EU Asia projects should definitely undertake some sort of a preliminary mapping of the digital context of the Asian country or the sub-region where they intend to work. Uh, we do this all the time in our physical on-site projects where we would go and have a go and see prep trip and where we would check everything from airport taxis to hotels to conference venues. We would visit as many cultural actors as we can in the city or country that we're going to operate in and understand local context. Uh, I think we need to start doing this digitally as well. Uh, because if we know what infrastructure is available, what equipment is available, what internet costs are like for our Asian partners, we could then perhaps work towards channeling some of the savings from our travel costs into improving the digital assets and access of our partners. Uh, this in turn will lead us to ask more questions. Can public funds actually be allocated to buy capital assets for our partners? The answer is unfortunately often no. So this then opens up yet another conversation about perhaps bringing on board technology partners or sponsors. So I think having some sort of uh, an understanding of the digital context in which uh, European partners intend to work in Asia is very, very useful to, to make sure that we're going to be inclusive. And lastly, I would like to advocate that for all Europe Asia projects that we do take the time to sort of invest in a digital equity auditor to kind of evaluate the project purely in terms of how digitally inclusive it was. It can be something relatively simple. You bring together two digital equity auditors, one from Asia, one from Europe. Uh, perhaps they, one could come from the cultural sector and another from the technology or social justice sector. And they could evaluate the project upon completion and identify uh, what were the success factors and what were the gaps, purely speaking, about the digital connection uh, being made. So these are two recommendations of a digital context mapping at the start and a, and a sort of a digital equity auditing at the end uh, of projects, I, I feel, could, could help us somehow bridge the, the digital divide that may not seem visible, but definitely does exist for parts of Asia. So with that, Caroline, I return the floor to you. <laughs> Fantastic. Anu, that was so helpful. Um, what I particularly appreciated was, yes, you gave many very specific, concrete examples of, um, of different ways that you're um, trying to improve the connectivity. And what I heard here is that it's not just a matter of better digital platforms. It's a matter of understanding the material brick and mortar conditions through which they're being deployed, reminding us that the internet is actually a physical thing. It's actually cables. It's actually satellite towers. It's actually electricity currents that have to make sure that they're always up and running. And then also what we call the wetware problem or uh, maybe challenge of the human beings that then are using this. And that as much as it's important to set up like cool infrastructure and we know that UX does affect like how people use things, it's like, incentivizing the connections between people. It's not just make sure you have 5G, it's make sure that you incentivize person A and person B to find each other online. Uh, I really appreciate that. I think that's something that all of us can use even um, in very, very local artist context to quite macro context, no matter where we are in the world. Uh, and, and also this idea that um, your organization is very conscious of uh, global North Asia, global South Asia, and the, you know, it's really, uh, it, it's, it's quite a universe that needs to be connected. And what we can take, what we can learn from seeing how ASAF is connecting even countries within Asia and how we might apply that to a global context. Um, I think this is a great segue to now speak with Bennett and we'll come back to Anu and hopefully Elisa and Anu, I can see some, I mean, from, I guess, all of you, um, but we'll, we'll continue unpacking what you gave us there. But let's now uh, transition over to Bemnet, who is, um, talk about the material and the digital. Um, my understanding, Bemnet, is that that really has been the challenge for you this past year with Tebebe Adababe uh, and taking a very physical, um, loose infrastructure, street level, um, uh, informal uh, type of cultural exchange, and then somehow 
putting it into a digital space and hoping there's connectivity and, and you know, questions of digital equality it must be paramount. So can you speak a bit about what this process is? And although your, your colleague spoke, Alexander Tor, uh, spoke earlier today about the project, maybe you can reprise a bit about what the 2019 iteration was and how the two, or 2020, 2019 iteration and now what 2021 looks like. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, as you mentioned, I'm sure Alexandra mentioned uh, a little bit about the project, but uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, the project by itself uh, focuses on getting the, the general public by going into the streets and uh, promoting the culture and culture uh, artworks. Uh, to give you a little bit context, art is not, uh, art is believed as a luxury in, in, in our country. Uh, uh, the people can't afford to uh, experience, to believe that they can't afford to experience or that's the, they don't give it a priority to go to our art, art exhibitions and uh, performing art, to, to see performing arts, arts and related things. So by that context in 2019, uh, to, starting from 2017, uh, Badawa started taking art to the streets. And uh, this year round, uh, we are planning to, to have a large street festival that's, that can reach a lot of number of participants and then to create much more awareness about uh, these uh, art and art related activities. And then COVID happened and immediately we started thinking, how can we adapt with it? And uh, that's when we started to compare the physical world with the online sphere. And when we do that, we found out a huge overlap between the way the physical world and the online wor world works. Uh, as the streets are the socializing spaces for the physical world, the social media platforms are the, social, the socializing spaces for the online world. And uh, as organizations mostly use their websites and digital news outlets to reach public, uh, to, to reach the public and promote art and art related uh, works, the majority of the public is focused on the posts, the tweets, the stories, and the memes that are circulating in social medias. So as in the physical world, majority of the people are focused on their day-to-day -day routine rather than uh, exposing, uh, exploring other means of uh, uh, experiencing other things. So in a way, the, the social media and the, 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 the streets, are, the social medias are the streets of the online world. So uh, once, we, once we made this connection, it was easier to take our festival to these streets, the online streets that are the social medias. And, as, uh, and, I, and I think uh, this thought process is what made that uh, Badawai success in the uncertain time by, by taking it online and incorporating uh, this, this socializing factor of the, the online world uh, and using that to our advantage. Yeah, that's great. The social media as the streets of the digital sphere. That's absolutely true. Um, I wonder, though, of course, since these platforms, they, you know, we know that they are alg algorithmically driven and those algorithms aren't always aligned with uh, to incentivize the same things that we as human individuals or as communities want to incentivize. Did you find yourself coming up against any challenges that you needed to work around or were there like ways that you game the algorithm a bit to ensure that you had optimal spread? Yeah, actually, one of one of one of the major challenges we faced was these online platforms are very crowded and everyone wants to get an attention. So uh, it, it goes towards to a certain, a certain content. So uh, on the, well, one of the major difficulties was on, on the street festival, the passerbys come to the artist. Uh, but when it comes to an online platform, the artists go to each and every participant through these social, uh, social media platforms. So, uh, which was a contest with uh, other content creators on social media. So, uh, a, f a festival without, and then getting, producing a festival without an audience wasn't uh, what we were thinking. So, what we did was, rather than only one platform or the artist or the festival platform, uh, we shared these uh, the stim similar contents in different platforms so that the algorithms can pick it. So platforms like uh, the 
the participating artists, obviously, and then we had a lot of uh, European and local partners, and then we also used their, their social media platforms. And also we made the participants use or create the content so that they can magnify the content of the festival. And in that manner, we created, uh, along with the artists, the participating artists, we created different activities that incorporate the audience to create their own content that contributes to the, the festival. In that manner, we, we somehow propagated throughout the participants' make. Yeah, and that makes so much sense because, of course, the online experience is very much about the crowd, the hive, uh, creating the creating the energy current, the the signal. It's it's always a two way back and forth. Um, I wonder. I mean, there's sometimes a problem with content moderation that becomes an issue, or that you know you choose certain artists to be part of your festival, and then you can't choose your participants. Did you have any challenges with content moderation or incentivizing higher quality content? I know also, as your colleague said, uh, you know, culture is a form of knowledge transmission. So there was a bit of a, you know, there, not exactly that artists being instrumentalized here, but that there were certain values or certain lessons that I know this project does try to advance. How did you maintain high quality contributions despite the, the hive form Form of generating speaking or content. Uh, yeah, prior to that, one of the other challenges were not even for the participants, but for the artists, because the entire preparation of the festival started prior of COVID. So uh, the artists were preparing to to deliver a physical uh, interactive activities. So because of that, so we had we had to somehow train and then share different experiences with the artists so that they can frame themselves into converting these ideas into an online platform. So that was the, one of the major challenges. So we, 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 we give different trainings and then give access, access to other experience create, create curators in an online platform to share their experience. In that manner, the artists somehow prepared their own content to be somehow created by the audience and then we somehow collaborated with them as well and we we asked the public we incentivized the in, the the participation of the public and the public was somehow uh, interactive and playing throughout the throughout the activities of the festival and some uh, for example I will, I will give you a very good example in this one of the the the, the curators that those were architects uh, in were focusing on uh, transportation uh, means of different cities and they were illustrating it uh, in an artistic form. And they came up with an activity that will request the public to share their day-to-day -day transportation experience. Uh, and it, it, it wasn't really about the quality of the content, but it was about the, the story that those contents told us. And uh, they, they, they got the chance to reach more than 30 countries in the world and they, they gathered content and then they somehow illustrated in an artistic manner. That's great. I mean, one thing we've also found in this digital transformation is that what we understand quality to be is quite a bit different, right? I mean, even today with there being some trouble with the platform, I mean, it doesn't matter really. We're all used to it. That's not how we judge quality anymore. It is way more about content. And um, maybe in some ways that also prepares us to get out of uh, traditional ideas of maybe a more like European classical idea of what quality is. Um, so we're all going through this transformation. Um, as a way of, I, I want to remind uh, our listeners that we would love to hear your questions and your comments. We are transitioning into, oh, okay, already we have it. Um, and I also have some questions for the different panelists to ask each other, but let's first see what we have from our listeners. So I'll read this, um, a question that says, some of you mentioned accessibility and digital equity. In the context of the EU cultural relations strategy, how can the EU and EU cultural institutes address digital equality and accessibility more effectively? So I guess, it, I mean, again, as practical as we, in a practical way as possible that we can answer this question. Um, and I don't know if this is maybe first, uh, like a question from Elisa and Harry um, sitting in, in a European context. And then maybe we ask uh, Anu and Bemnet to sort of um, vet that and say, see, see what they hear or stress test that a little bit. Uh, so Elisa or Harry first. 
I, I can try and and uh, kick it off. I'm happy to hand it over to Harry then. Um, so I think th the the most obvious thing would be for European cultural institutions, because they are also in a privileged role, like they have reach, they have resources, that they make their decisions on which tools to use uh, very knowingly and in a very reflected, reflected way to make sure that these tools actually don't have people drop off while broadening the audiences on the other end. Um, there's there's an image that I really like. If we move digital, it has to be um, about raising the floor and not the ceiling. So when we talk about digitization and technology, it's often about this innovation image, right? We, we improve the technology, like we, we get more edgy, we get more fancy. And this is a thinking that I believe we need to leave behind um, if we talk about digitization in the cultural field and the cultural sector. It really needs to be about like stepping up the game slowly, slowly and making it possible for more people to come in before we make the whole experience more fancy and more fleshy uh, for the usual upper 10 or 20 percent. So yeah, use your tools wisely and also you have resources, invest in the tools, pay for the tools that are doing this already and don't just, you know, go to the tools, use the tools that are there and readily available. Um, Harry mentioned the, the open standards, the open stack, um, so I'm not going to go too deeply into this, but this is really something that we have to keep in mind, not take, not take the easy route. Yeah, raise the floor, not the ceiling. That's a good, that is a good thing for us to take with us today. And Harry, how, how, what do you hear in this? And also maybe in reference to this open stack. So there's this question of just the technology, but also the way that we engage with the technology. Yeah, I mean, I won't repeat too much. I think on the one hand, the equity comes with how you package the data and make it available, right? Now, open standards, obviously we've got licensing frameworks for that, that that's I think covered to some extent. I think the, the, the next frontier will be the, the stack itself. You know, what platform do you use um, and how do you use them? I completely agree. I think some form of digital literacy is required to make the right decisions. Uh, and that's going to be super hard. I think that's going to be uh, the, big the big challenge for the coming years, right? Because it's, you know, unfortunately, it's still the way to reach audiences at the moment are via big commercial platforms. Uh, we all know you become the product if you engage with that, um, yet you also can't not engage with it. I think to me, one of the, you know, the, the strategies could be to make sure that whenever you do that, you also make it available on other platforms so that there is an option, there's a choice for people to, to reach the material, uh, depending on how they would like it. That is such a good point. We often default to the the big stacks, uh, you know, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon stacks, um, or I guess like Alibaba and Baidu in, in, in Asia. Um, but we don't need to only use one stack. You can make something available on YouTube and on Facebook and on Twitch and on, you know, maybe even a more experimental platform. You can oftentimes very simply do that. So I hear from you saying like a level of digital education, um, also, you know, for European leaders, especially when there's generational gaps, younger people might be really comfortable in gaming spaces. These tools really aren't that hard to learn how to use are quite intuitive, but it you need to take time to learn these tools. It's not a waste of time to spend a Monday afternoon learning to use uh, like some gaming platform. Sometimes I can imagine somebody who's not of the same generation thinking that's a waste of time. It's not. It gives you a new avenue to reach, um, you know, people who the other platform isn't isn't accessible. So, you know, it, it is it is actually a good use of time to learn these new platforms and to experiment with platforms. Uh, and that's a great note. Uh, so raising the floor and also a form of education um, for using lots of different platforms and investing that time. Um, Anu and Bemnet, what do you hear in this? Or what are things that you might wish for European cultural organizations to be offering your organizations or the communities that you find yourselves interfacing with? I think what, what you said, uh, Caroline, before about, uh, you know, and what also Eliza echoed about rethinking our parameters as to what is innovative and, you know, chasing innovation or what is quality has to be completely rethought. Uh, because if we're looking to keep connections going and to make new connections in this moment when we can't travel, for instance, then digital is primarily uh, a tool. And that's maybe how it's being looked at from the other side. And 
the main thing is to see if, if this tool can, can reach uh, people. We've been hearing recently from a lot of Asian cultural professionals who, because of the, of the current situations in parts of Asia, have sort of moved to the to their you know to their native villages to work remotely from there because the situation is slightly better there than in the cities. But with this comes the disadvantage that rural areas in parts of Asia are even really poorly connected, and they're finding uh, it very difficult to connect to some of the more fancier and cooler platforms where you can do twenty things at the same time while attending a conference. They're barely even able to listen to the other speaker. So you see, so it's it's again under being respectful of the digital reality and sometimes to simply look at digital as a tool. It's the equivalent sometimes of an air ticket. So if we spend hours and hours thinking which airline will I fly and which seat will I take, then it kind of defeats uh, the purpose. But on the flip side, again, with, with airlines, we were uh, looking at the big carbon question and the climate change question. And that's something I, I don't see us discussing with, with digital. Digital is not uh, environment as environmentally friendly as, uh, you know, as we think it is. And this is something to include uh, in our evaluation of digital projects because we're, we are now online digitally all the time and what is really the cost of that. Uh, what we were saying again about young people, that's again something uh, I think in Asia, young people are really digital natives. They're, they're online, they have multiple gadgets. But when we try to, to recreate the intergenerational conversations digitally, well, that, that's sometimes a struggle because you need to be able to provide some sort of support to, to the more expert senior people and, and make sure that they remain engaged digitally for longer windows of time. And that's not always so easy. Language is a perpetual issue. Uh, for us, we, we, we see that the parts of you know China, uh, South Korea, they use that completely different platforms like Kakao Talk and WeChat. So if, if you're going to go with the major platforms and go in English, even pre-pandemic, you've lost a whole segment, a whole audience, because in, in, in countries like uh, Korea and China, uh, a large part of the work is done in their own languages. So again, it's, it's what I mentioned before, if we're working in English, then we'll need to find ways to translate the outputs and make them available on these local channels if we want people to know what's happening and then make an attempt to, to reach us. If not, we're operating in a very, very, very small sort of uh, area. So in that sense, I think we have to think about multiple platforms also from the point of view of, of language. Yeah. So those are um, my thoughts. Just Briefly, one follow-up question. We also see a hardening of digital stacks a bit. We see that especially, this is mostly, I think, an issue with, with China maybe uh, and America, but do you find that there are any best practices for making sure that content isn't like, not exactly paywall, but like state-walled behind, uh, you know, digital protocol um, barriers? Uh, this is this is very difficult because unfortunately, I think in certain conversations uh, we do end up leaving some people behind uh, because we're not able to move entire conversations to a different platform or offer it to multiple platforms just to, to accommodate maybe one speaker. And this is very unfortunate that is happening more and more. So I think this is going to be a, a, a classic problem for us going forward. Also, we, we face this not only while engaging with cultural professionals, but also certain, if you want to engage with policymakers in parts of Asia, then they use very specific platforms. So you have five different speakers, each wants to operate on a different platform. Uh, you want all of them in your conversation and uh, you have to find a way through it. This is very, very tricky. It's also for organizations that, you know, in the past were not, you know, we're, we're learning digital as we go along. Uh, so we're also having to invest more and more on digital resources and upskilling our own digital infrastructure, uh, because if, if we just use whatever we are most comfortable with, then in a year from now, we would have left out a lot of people. So do we have the time and resources to really up ourselves in terms of technology? I think this, this is a big challenge we're facing because we, we go with the default platforms on most days, you know, and everyone. So. Yes, I totally. And one more question for Harry before we go to Bemnet, just following on that, is do you see Europeana, are, you can, you know, you are a public space, um, you're a European commons for uh, a global audience. Do you see yourselves trying to work with any partners or um, even internally develop any tools that would be able to get past some of these state barriers? Or is that beyond the purview of what you're doing? 
And no, it's certainly something we're uh, we're investigating. There's some. Um, I think there's a growing movement across Europe. Uh, I know. I mean, the country where I am in the Netherlands. I know there is a movement that is that is actively working on creating um, uh, tools to investigate. Okay, how how open is your stack, for example? So you can actually just like you would do for a carbon footprint, right? You could you could measure yourself against uh, you know public sphere um, criteria. And based on that, you could take measures to become a little bit more public. And I think that's that incremental movement, that, that's something that we need to completely focus on. Yeah. That's so helpful. I did not know that that existed. How open is your stack? That is great. Um, uh, if, if you have any resources that you want to drop in the chat, it would be interested to, uh, if there's a site for that, I'd be interested to know. Um, thank you. And Ben, that um, now coming to you, what do you, um, you know, ha having worked very close to the fire this past year on this transformation, what do you wish existed? Or what are you happy that does exist in terms of digital tools or openness? So in, in, the, in terms of digital tools, like it was mentioned earlier, using different platforms is, is very important because there, there is there is a crowd attached to a certain platform, uh, whether it's it have different reason behind it. So using multiple platform by itself give give us access to to reach different type of individuals, and that is very important. But in addition to that, not only using the platforms but using the local partners is very important because they can address it in a way the local the locals can absorb it. So in that manner. You, that's the, the, the second important thing that I, I believe is, should, should be addressed. And then lastly, no matter, no matter the quality of the, the, the content or the depth of the content, no matter how accessible it is, it has to be promoted so that individuals know that it's accessible. Otherwise, it, it, it doesn't really have a meaning to, to the accessibility of the content. I think that's so important. Um, you know, we talk about Keller Easterling, the scholar talks about medium design, and she reminds us that data is not just the thing that goes through, you know, the, the is not just like the digital information that shows up on your screen. Data is also the connections between people. It's also the entire um, sphere of interactions between people, the connection, um, the environment where they're actually viewing it or receiving it. Can they play audio? Can they not play audio? Um, and that that this education has to happen on the level of just interpersonal exchange as well. Um, so that's a very helpful thing to keep in mind. When we talk about digital transformation, the data that's being transformed is also just in human relations and how they relate to the spaces. Um, so that's great. Um, so there's two more questions here and we have about 10 minutes left. So. Um, First, let me quickly, there's one to Anna Palma um, from a listener who says, you talked about the post-project phase of projects, how to convince project partners, sponsors of the importance of this phase, which is, I'm sure, yes, a, a problem across the board. Uh, working in a, in a funding uh, agency myself, uh, this is something we've been asked as well, because uh, funding agencies have their own funders and operate you know, they have limitations too, and it's usually the annual cycle that, that sort of then kills everything. Uh, I think the, these are negotiations to be had because the question is, what are you doing with the money saved from travel and accommodation and visa costs, which is usually the bulk of, of international project costs. And I think these are conversations to be had very, very early. Uh, post uh, project phase could also be funded by someone, you know, outside the funders of the original project if, if you manage to find local sponsors local partners who are willing to invest in the next phase of the project that's great but this means this conversation has to already be had at the pre-project uh, phase because no one's going to come in and support a project that's that's already complete uh, as i was saying before a lot of websites projects are great information but then when i'm looking for it two three years later basically the domain name is already you know, lost because nobody had renewed it and you feel terrible about it, then here I think technology partners could, could play a pretty great role. So one is to begin the conversation with the main funder right at the beginning and not to surprise them at the end because no one can, can change the rules along the way. But if it's not possible for the core funder to, to do it, uh, to start these conversations and use the, the main funder to open other doors, particularly with local partners, 
uh, perhaps uh, an embassy, perhaps a local technology organization, uh, other local funders, you could start applying for grants to keep uh, a website or a project uh, alive uh, maybe a year from now. So those are uh, things in which the main funder could actually support you, uh, could, could lend their name, could, could open doors for you. So that could, could be an uh, option as well. And I think it's very important to, to have conversations among funders because very rarely do funders come together and, and discuss their challenges. So this must be a very common challenge. And perhaps it's also an opportunity now for, for funders to, to you know, have an annual conversation of sorts and, and see how uh, someone else has sorted it out. Because very often in the cultural sector, we're constantly doing trial and errors because we only share the successes of our projects. We rarely share the things that have gone wrong. And uh, so I think it, it's time to also start sharing those because I, I'm sure someone has figured out a solution to this, but it's just that they haven't shared it. Absolutely. And hopefully, I mean, just this culture, I think we've gotten beyond the like the very techie uh, fail fast, but I think we all are much more comfortable with experimentation and not seeing like short-term failure as larger uh, as larger as fail failure on the systemic level. It only is when we hide all those failures, right? And, and another thing, just to circle back, Anu, to something you said, um, you said earlier about like the post phase of these projects is almost like a precipitation of the digital information to the human uh, to the human community and letting it live on, in cultural memory. I think we also have an issue a bit with data obesity and the idea that, oh, if we save everything online, then it's going to be there. But no, not really, not unless people are engaging with it. And people don't really go to websites randomly. They go to social media because there's like an immediate dopamine rush for like getting that kind of engagement or, you know, to Google. But um, and, and maybe this is also a question. Uh, Harry for you, but it's how do you keep up engagement and how do you make sure that um, it's one thing, to, and this is maybe also following from another question we have, I'm sorry, I'm just paraphrasing a bit for time, um, but how do we keep this, all this digital information alive in a community? How do we keep it active? It's not enough to just be like, you know, check my website. It's like, how do you keep that uh, as a, um, an active circulation loop? Yeah. Uh, gosh, that's a, that's a big question. Um... I would say, I mean, on the one hand, we're doing, of course, I think participation, that's key. I think participation is key. So not just make your stuff available on a website where people can access it. That's not sufficient, right? Uh, somebody said, uh, Cory Doctor, um, you know, uh, conversation is king. Uh, content is just something to talk about. <laughs> I, think, I think keeping that in mind is, is re really critical. How to do that? Very difficult. Um, we've experimented uh, with a couple of different formats. We've done a pretty successful run with the First World War, where we invited uh, we invited people physically to bring their artifacts from the attic, right? So <laughs> letters, it could be a helmet, you know, from their grandfathers, bring their own stories in, right, to a public place like a library. We digitize it. We'd bring it in, online into a certain space, and that's where the conversation would then start. So that was an interesting experiment. It had a good run. We now need to figure out other ways to do that. But what I, I really like what you said about data obesity and also sort of this obsession with uh, numbers and traffic and so forth and the dopamine rush. I think that's something we need to educate ourselves in, not to be so obsessed with it. Um, you know, it feels like. In the online environment, you know, there's there's only the, the choice of restaurants is limited to McDonald's, uh, Burger King, and, uh, and Kentucky Fried Chicken, right? There's this you know, high sugar, big rush, and I think we what our role is to provide the alternatives, the slow food alternatives online, where you know you, you can come if you want to engage with it, if that's what makes you tick, if that's because you feel more res that's a more responsible environment for you to be in. It still leaves the question: How do you how do you engage people with it? Uh, I don't have your conclusive answer there, but uh, yeah, just amusing. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I definitely we're all stuck in the food court of uh, online media. That does sound about right. Um, <laughs> since since we don't have too much more, I'm oh, sorry. Sorry, maybe to 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 add, to add on this point uh, because by, by the end of our festival, we 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 had an online exhibition and we were experimenting on how to pull individuals to our website to see the, the, the digital exhibition. So what we were doing was 
as as we experimented with the streets of the online which is the social medias we started pro producing teasers of the contents and then sharing it on this online media so that it can on the social media that it can create a conversation so that a lot of people could be pulled out of that there to 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 integrate it to the website and to ex ex see the entire exhibition and that was a very good tool that really worked for us and gave us the chance to uh, to reach a lot of people yeah absolutely i mean i guess just participation right um uh, making making people see the online space is something where they it, it, there is a social relation it's not just going into an abyss that it, it's like they they participate so that they can feel seen also. Um, and you know, there's going to be a human component. You go online to have a human connection in a sense, um, which makes a lot of, which makes a lot of sense. Um, I wonder, since we only have a few minutes left, if there's any last comment, particularly maybe from Elisa, um, that I, I'd love to hear also your take on any of the past few questions, um, but I, or if anybody else has any parting, uh, parting comments to offer those. Just one quick thing that came to mind when we were talking about like the, the, also the data obesity thing, but also about like what, what needs to be preserved and maybe what doesn't. Um, I would really love if we produce all that online content to think more about what is to be there forever and what is ephemeral by design. So this might also help to engage audiences in, 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 in talking about the product and an online installation if they know that this is going to vanish. I think in the last year we have filled the internet with online panels, with videos, with talks. I'm not sure that they have to stay around forever, to be honest. And this is something that we should be more aware of beforehand before we produce. Totally. And not judge ourselves too. I know there's a lot of anxiety of like, oh, this only got a hundred streams or a thousand streams or whatever. And that's not always the metric. I mean, high quality engagement is definitely better than mass engagement, or at least can be. Um, and so not letting ourselves be ruled by those metrics, but rather from individual feedback um, from from humans, from, from organizations, what they have to say if it's useful for them. Uh, so we're not always competing the same way. Um, we have to end just about now, um, but I don't know if anybody has any last comment that they want to make. Otherwise, we will wrap this up. Maybe one one last thing is whenever we create a social an online content, it's very important to 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 make feel the audience that they are part of it, that they are they are the owners, and then they contribute to it in that manner. They they, they can feel the ownership and then be fully engaged. And then uh, that 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 will that that will create the attachment that we want to continue. Totally, that idea of shared ownership. Um, I mean, I know just from our community, new models that is very important. And one thing that we've done, if I'll offer one, uh, one personal experience, is precipitating things from the digital sphere to a physical object that somebody can have and put on their shelf or carry with them. Um, we found that um, that sense of owning this digital content in this physical, personal way has been very helpful for feeling like our activity online is meaningful and not just busy work or something that you remember for five minutes and then forget. Uh, so I imagine each each cultural context will have a different way of doing that. But um, the digital is so much more than just screens. I think that's really what we're learning here. Um, and I, I really appreciate all of your uh, input. Anu, Kerry, Elisa, Bemnet, thank you for your time today. Um, thank you to UNIC and for the European Spaces for Culture for making this conversation possible. Uh, there's some links that have been shared. I think they've also been shared onto the Confiva platform. Um, but we'll make sure that they're there uh, for following up on any of the things that you've heard just now. Um, we're going to take a short break now of, of about 15 minutes, and we will reconvene on this same Confiva platform for the conference's final session, which features a keynote by Stefano Sanino, who's the Secretary General of European External Action Service, who will offer thoughts on the role of culture in the EU's activity on the global political stage. That will be followed by a discussion with EU Parliament member Salima Yenbao, cultural policy expert Kimani Njogo, joining from Kenya, uh, curator and cultural critic Katarina Botanova, and UNIC director Gita Schock. So um, in the break, there's also in the main stage, the main plenary room, you'll see uh, there's a film made by the team of the Nugan Batar 
Eco, I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce that, at Nogon Batar Eco Art Festival, um, the European Spaces of Culture pilot project in Mongolia. So while you're getting yourself a coffee or whatnot, you can watch that. Uh, and we'll see you back here in 15 minutes. So thank you again to Yunik. Thank you, Harry, Anu, Elisa, Bennett. Uh, and I hope you have a nice evening, afternoon. Ciao.